Let's pray and begin Sabbath school. Can we pray? God, once again, we thank you for another opportunity to, to gather to study your word. We ask that you would bless us as we study. Give us insight as to what you're trying to teach us in this lesson. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This won't be a long Sabbath school lesson today because as you heard, they have dinner downstairs. Amen. And once that food, once that food starts smelling in your nostrils, I, your attention span is not going to be, and I understand because I'm, I'm ready myself. Okay. Let's start with our today's Sabbath school lesson. We're on lesson number what? Six? Lesson number six. He died for us. He died for us. And, uh, okay, and I was going to have them play the song. If we had the internet, we were going to do, have them play just for me, Donald McClurkin. How many of you know that Jesus would have left heaven just for you? <laughs> just for one. If, it had been just, if you had been the only one, God would have come just for you. All right, so... Uh, that's our memory text. Let's read this together. Now, remember, we're online, so we have to read loud and enthusiastically. David Wooten, you can hold your microphone up as we read. Let's read together. Read. And as Moses dubbed the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. All right. All right. So, a very familiar text. Now, David, read that. It has not been said that we cannot avoid death and taxes. That's not entirely true. People can avoid taxes, but not death. They might be able to put death off a few years, but sooner or later, death always comes. And because we know that the dead, both the righteous and the wicked, end up at first in the same place. Our hope of the resurrection means everything to us. This week, we will focus on Christ's death and what it means for the promise of eternal life. All right. So uh, we're going to begin Sunday's lesson. Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. Now, it says, what does this verse teach us? And I don't know if you can see that. What does this verse teach us about how long ago the plan of salvation centered on Christ's death had been in place? In other words, here's the question. When, did, when was the plan of salvation formulated? And it tells us that in Titus. Can you read that, David? That's in red. Can yeah. you re read? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. All right. So it says, God, that cannot lie, before the world began, before the world began, the plan of salvation was put in place. Now, let me ask a question, but I need to see some hands raised. Why was the plan of salvation put in place before the world began? I see a hand here. Come on, son, you got to run quick. I see two hands. <laughs> Come on, son, you got to move quick. God, God knew uh, in the beginning that man was going to fail. So it wasn't an afterthought of his. He already made this plan in creation. When he created this world and, and created us, he knew that we were going to fail. So he was preparing for that fall that we were going to do. All right. Anybody else? I thought I saw another hand. Very good. Very good. I saw another hand right there. I believe that God didn't know it was our choice he gave us a choice if we will uh, sin before he created man and um, because it was a possibility that we would sin that he had the plan already in place ah okay so now brother Kirkwood introduced another idea now anybody agree with his idea uh, okay yay nay y'all good with that so brother brother Kirkwood kind of gave a spare tire it's kind of, but let me ask you a question. Why do you have insurance? What's that? Just in case. So do you plan on your house burning down? Do you plan on having a car accident? <laughs> right? But what? Just in case. 
Right, because things happen just in case. Now, God in his fault, now you have to realize, and I'm glad you, we, we went down that road. Um, God lives, now, pay attention to this. God lives in the past, the present, and the future, right? God also lives in a space that's called counterfactuals. Know what that is? We talked about this before. That's a place where God knows what would have happened if things had happened a certain way. Right? God lives in all of that. So God is prepared. Nothing catches God by surprise. We're surprised by various events, but nothing catches God by surprise. So God was well prepared. It was not an afterthought. All right, let's move on. I think I moved too quick. So read that. Read a part of that, David. The cross was part of God's plan. Christ's death on the cross was not an afterthought, but part of a well-laid plan for the ages of eternity. Acts 2, 23, 1 Peter 1 and 20. The promise of redemption in Genesis 3.15 required Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. All right, stop right there. Promise, we don't have time to read all these texts. You all know that text. Genesis 3.15, the first promise the promise of the Messiah after man had sinned. Now, but it promised, it required a sacrifice on Calvary, a sacrifice. Now read this, read this next, uh, read the next sentence. Read. This is why an animal was killed in order to clothe Adam and Eve's nakedness. That animal represented Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All right, so the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, it said it required an animal sacrifice. Why did it require an animal sacrifice? Why does something have to die? Now, let me, let me expand on this question. Why does something have to die? What was important about the death of something? What was, this, what, what, what was God trying to demonstrate? It was said that when that might have been the first thing that, that ever died when God clothed man in the skin of an animal that might have been the first thing on earth that ever died. Now, what was God trying to tell us with the sacrifice? I need, I, raise your hands and, 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 where's my runners? Okay, listen, come on runners, you got to be, move quickly. Think that, I think that sacrifice was by mistake. We don't wear animals. You, you said what? That sacrifice was by mistake. We don't wear animals. We don't wear animals, but there was a purpose for it, we, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll explain that in a minute. There was a purpose for it. Anybody else? Think, think. Why, why was it required? Why was the sacrifice required? It took, it took blood to cover the sin, so some had to die, and it was pointing to the lamb that were going to be slain from the okay. foundation of the world. Great answer, but I need you to think a little deeper. We, 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 we got a hand down here. Got to run quick, son. Brother Claude and class, possibly the innocence of an animal who hadn't done anything, but yet he was going to have to die. There we go. Now listen, what, the, what it was, was it wasn't so much to, be, to, to clothe the, the man with it. With, what God was trying to demonstrate was how bad sin was. Did y'all get that? God was trying to actually show you how bad sin was. Now, I was going to put this in the last part of the lesson, but this is a good place to stay. God, he's not a vengeful God. If you do wrong, then I got to kill you. No. But he's trying to show you just how offensive, and something happens in my microphone. He's trying to show you how offensive sin is. Right. So now watch this. When they used to bring the animal sacrifices to the priest, I always had this concept wrong, and you probably did too. I thought that they went to the priest, they brought the animal to the priest, they confessed their sins, they took off and left. And the priest did all this. No. Guess what happened? Guess what happened? You bring the sacrifice to the priest, you confess your sins. I told a lie, I did this, I did that. Right. And the priest said, okay. But the first thing the priest did was inspect the lamb. Make sure it wasn't the old crippled, broken down lamb that you didn't want. 
It had to be with what? Without spot, without blemish, because it represented the Lamb of God. Is everybody with me? Everybody on board? Now, so the priest would inspect the lamb and say, okay, this, this, this is a good sacrifice. You confess your sins. This is what you did. Guess what the next thing the priest did with the knife? He handed it to you. You had to kill the animal. Let that sink in for a minute. Now, anybody here ever grew up on a, in a, on a farm in the place? Anybody ever grew up? Has anybody ever seen an animal slaughtered? It ain't a pretty thing, is it? <laughs> it's not a pretty thing. And Brother Tibbs said something that was interesting. He wanted to show an innocent animal that, that didn't have anything to do with what you did would die. Right? He was trying to show you how offensive sin was. And so that you were reconsider. Because how many of you know sin is a choice? <laughs> now, every now and then, some kind of sneaks up on you real quick, you know. <laughs> No quick sins, Brother Hyman. You know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you, and you stir up your foot on the, on, on, on the chair. You know, one of, them quick, one of them quick sins, you know, kind of sneak up on you every now and then, Sister Minnie. But now, sin is a choice, right? So, so when you choose to sin, he wants you to see how bad it was, that it cost an innocent person their life. Is everybody with me? Okay, that's good. Read that, David. The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. All right, so from the foundation, from the very beginning, this didn't catch, this didn't catch God by surprise, right? The foundation. Now, uh, our reflection question talks about that. It says, animal sacrifices are gruesome and bloody. That is true. But why is this gruesomeness and blood, bloodless, bloodiness precise to the point, teaching us about Christ and our place and what terrible cost of sin? He wants you to see that. He wants you to feel it. Again, if you've never had, if you've never seen, and you could go on YouTube and even see it now, if you, if you see what even what happens in slaughterhouses, how they kill innocent animals, it makes you think twice about it. <laughs> about eating some of that stuff. It is horrible. And God wants you to see, because see, sin has been glossed over in our society. Sin is glorified, right? Sin, you, you, you look on TV, sin is glorified. Sin is promoted. Sin is made to look like it's, it's, it's fun and it's good and it's happy. I mean, we laugh when we see people sin. You know, it, 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 it's no big thing. But God wants you to see the cost of sin, the true cost of sin. Let's move on. Okay, so this Monday's lesson, a preference to the cross. Our memory texts here are from Matthew, and these are very familiar texts in Matthew 16, 21 through, through 23. Read. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. All right, stop, there, stop right there before you read the, the next verse. So Jesus is telling them he's getting ready to die, and Peter takes him aside. Peter said, Come here, Lord. Let me whisper in your ear. I got, now, what's all this dying talk? What, what, you know, what's going on with this dying you're talking about? This ain't going to happen to you. Now, Brother Leo Tate just got a thought in his mind. I, I can see him way back here. <laughs> I can see Brother Leo Tate thinking way back there. So get ready to get a microphone over there to Brother Tate. Where's my, where's my microphone runners? Okay, so I see Brother Leo Tate thinking way back there. So now, Brother Tate, why did Peter say that to Jesus? He, <coughs> he knew what Jesus could do, but he didn't think that he would do it. Ah, okay. Very good. Hold on to the microphone for a minute. Read the last verse, David. But he turned and said... Your microphone not on. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, 
Now, Brother Tate, here's the question, Brother Tate. Now, y'all, y'all, y'all just amen that. But that, that same, that same kind of hard. Peter just said, Peter was looking out for Jesus. He said, my, my Lord, now wait a minute. This can't happen to you. And it looks like Jesus called him Satan. <laughs> I mean, Jesus was, so now, Brother Tate, the question to you is, why did Jesus talk to Peter so harshly? Because that was the devil that was speaking through, through Peter. <laughs> Amen. Jesus looks at the intent of the heart right now. That was indeed, that, that was. But now here's the other thing about this, and I, as I did some study on this, that indeed was, that indeed was the devil speaking through him, right? Giving him, but now here's the whole point. Peter, every time we look at Peter, we think of Peter as being the one that always had a big mouth, always there was, you know, talking and out of turn, that kind of stuff. But, and we see him as an a ignorant fisherman who, who did a whole lot of cussing and carrying on, you know, like some of y'all. But anyway, uh, so, but Peter was pretty smart. See, you kind of got to be smart to even be a fisherman. Any, we got any fishermen in here? Anybody? Y'all don't go fishing? Okay, anyway. But if you ever are fish, you got to be kind of smart. You can't go out there any time of day. You can't use any bait. You can't just go throw a line in the water. You got to go certain places. You got to be smart. But they say you got to be smarter than the fish. So Peter was pretty smart. Now, here's the thing. Let me move it quickly. The reason why Jesus answered Peter so sternly. Now, catch this. Catch this. The reason why Jesus asked, answered Peter so sternly was because Peter understood something that the other disciples didn't. He was going through Peter's mind. They all thought that Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom. What kind of kingdom? An earthly kingdom to overthrow the Romans. Did y'all get that point? When Jesus kept telling toward his death, Jesus kept saying, I'm going to die. My kingdom is not of this world. The rest of the disciples didn't quite get it, but Peter did. Now, that's why it says he pulled him aside. Peter said, now, wait a minute. Peter, it clicked with Peter that Jesus was really going to die. Now, Peter was saying, wait a minute. I thought when you set your kingdom up, I was going to be secretary of state. Right? No, I was going to be vice president. <laughs> and John was going to be secretary of state. And my brother James was going to be uh, 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 the secretary of commerce. And Judas said, yeah, I was going to be the secretary of treasury in your new kingdom. Right? But so what happened, it really started clicking with Peter. Peter said, wait a minute. He's really going to do this. He's really going to die. We got to talk about this. And that's why Jesus asked him, because Jesus knew that he really understood what he was talking about. The rest of the disciples were still kind of clouded on this issue, right? Now, to, show, to back that point up, let's see how good you are back there, fellas, because I told, I told the, the, the crew back there I was going to challenge them a little bit. Now, to show you that they didn't really understand, that they really didn't understand Jesus' full mission, get this, they didn't even understand it after Jesus had died on the cross. Y'all want me to back that up? I see, I see some doubt. I see, your, I see some doubt in your face. Look how Sister Wilson looking at me. <laughs> I see some doubt in your face. They didn't understand, even after Jesus had died on the cross, Brother Tears, they were still looking for the earthly kingdom. Give me Acts, I think, 1 9. You see the Acts 1 6 and 1 9. Hurry up, fellas. I told them I was going to challenge them back there to, to see how fast they could move with stuff and then put the PowerPoint back on. I think it's Acts 1. Yeah, start reading that. We'll, we'll start with that. Read that, David. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Next verse, keep going. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now stop. Let's get, let's get on board where we are. When was this? Talk to me. When was this? So after, so this, Jesus died. He's getting ready to go back to heaven. So he, he, he's good. <laughs> he's been resurrected. Read on. 
I need my text back up there, fellas. <laughs> I went through yet. Keep going. Which also said. Read quick, son. Read quick. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Keep going. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. All right, now, let me see if you got my right text there. Uh, okay, so, uh, I'm sorry, I started, you too early. I started you too early. Go back to verse 6. So now this is the same scenario. Go back to verse 6. That's what I was trying to get to. Now, we see the scenario. This is when they were, when Jesus was being, when Jesus was taken to heaven. I'm going to show you that they didn't even understand uh, the mission. Read that, verse 6. they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Y'all see that? Y'all see that? The first part, so you know the setting was when Jesus was going right to heaven. Y'all see that right there? They still thought. So they say, okay, Jesus, now that you got all this dying out the way, now that you've been resurrected, okay, that's fine. You're talking about this spiritual kingdom. I'll, am I still going to be secretary of state? <laughs> am I still going to be the vice president? <laughs> am I still going to be? They still didn't understand the mission. So, and we're going to move quickly. That's why he spoke so harsh to Peter, because Peter understood that. Peter understood that he wasn't setting up an earthly kingdom, right? But they still had hope, so that's why he spoke to them. Then, after this text, he said, okay, y'all, listen, I can't deal with y'all no more. I'm fixing to go to heaven. Y'all tarry here. <laughs> y'all go to the upper room. Y'all tarry here till the Holy Spirit comes, and he'll teach y'all all things. I got to go, <laughs> right? Because I've been here, so y'all still don't understand. All right, let's move on. Back to the PowerPoint. So, so Jesus was born to die. Now, can you imagine that? We, and we're moving quickly. Next slide. Jesus was born to die. Read that, David. Jesus was, Jesus was born to die, and he lived to die. Every step that he took brought him closer to his great atoning sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Fully conscious of his mission, he did not allow anyone or anything to distract him from it. In reality, his whole life was a prefix, prefix to his death on the cross. Now, you know, inspiration tells us something very interesting. We, we move very quickly. At some point in time, remember, Jesus was born in a manger, you know, born in Bethlehem. He was born, he was, he was fully God, fully man, but he grew up as a, as a little boy. At some point in time, get this, when Jesus was going to the temple and, and watching the temple sacrifices and stuff, Sister Allie, at some point, inspiration tells us when Jesus looked at the sacrifice, he realized something, even as a young boy. He realized, that's me. That's me. Have you ever had something on your mind that's been something that's coming, that maybe something negative or something, something that's always in the back of your mind? No matter what you're dealing with, it's always kind of in the back of your mind. You know, you, you're thinking about it. Well, let, let, let's say it this way. Anybody ever had a bill? <laughs> Anybody ever had a bill that was in the back of your mind? <laughs> You know, you're doing this, you're doing that, but that bill is still kind of in the back of your mind. You know it's due. You know it's coming. Y'all ain't talking to me. Y'all understand that? That's the same. About now, now imagine, imagine a little boy growing up thinking about this mission. And everything he was doing was pointing toward the cross. Now, and Jesus knew this wasn't going to be a pleasant death on the cross. This, remember, we just talked about this. Remember the animal sacrifice that we just talked about that was gruesome? The cross was more gruesome than that. So this was always in the back of Jesus' mind, but just for you, he did it. I heard three half-hearted amens. I said, just for you, he did it. <laughs> Amen. All right. So next slide. So, oh, I got it up here. I forgot. Here we go. Read that, David. If you can see it, read. Though they were plainly revealed, yet such were their prejudices and their unwillingness to believe them that they did not understand them. They expected that he would be a temporal prince and a conqueror, and they were not willing to believe that he would be delivered into the hands of his enemies. 
They did not see how that could be consistent with the prophecies. All right, so now read this right here. Jesus spoke again to his disciples about his death and resurrection because it was not what they wanted to hear. They didn't listen. How easy it is for us to do the same. All right, they didn't want to hear that because they, now here's the thing, that let, let's, let's be kind to our disciples. Have you ever, and I was going to do this, we don't have time to do this right now. I was going to try to demonstrate this, but I'll just ask the question. Have you ever believed something or thought you knew something, and later on you found out that it wasn't what you thought it was at first? I mean, it could be something simple. Like, let me see, can I give a, let me see how good these fellows are. Let me see how good these fellows are. Give me a picture of a, of a kitchen oven, not a commercial oven, a, a, a kitchen oven. While I'm talking, give me a picture of a kitchen oven. The kind of goes in your house, not, not a commercial one. And, uh, but there are certain things that you always thought. Now, why, why are they getting that picture up? Because I just thought about this, this example. Um, how many of you know that the, how many of you were taught that the earth rotates around the sun? That's really not true. It's really not true. Now, the earth rotates around the sun sometimes, but it actually rotates around, um, it, it, it actually rotates around the, 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 it, the, the orbit. The orbit, sometimes it rotates around the sun and sometimes it just rotates by itself. But the point is that there are a lot of things that we thought that we knew that sometimes science later on comes and debunks, right? Right? You know, and so there are several different things that they thought they knew. Where's my soul, fellas? They, they, they working hard back there. I'm, I told them I'm going to work them good. <laughs> I told them I'm going to work them good back there. Oh, that's right. We don't have internet. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I'm sorry, fellas. Y'all should have told me. I forgot because you, you can't go online and get it because we don't have it. But, okay, let me, let, let me see. Can it, okay, use your imagination real quick. How many in your house, how many of you have just a regular oven, a regular stove in the kitchen? Let me see. Let's show hands. Okay, now, if you have one that sits on the floor, not one that's built into the wall, but just one that sits on the floor, at the very bottom, there you go right there. There we go. Let, let, let's give these fellas a hearty amen. They, put, they pulled it off. <laughs> All right. Now, most of, most of us didn't know that the top, and some of you might have, but the top of the oven actually can lift up. On most of us, the top can actually lift up. Why is that? So you can clean, yeah. right? And for those who don't clean, you probably didn't know that. <laughs> All right. Some of y'all ain't never lifted that top of the oven up. <laughs> Tell the truth. Y'all, you're in church. Now, here's what you probably didn't know. Now, that little section, I wish I had a, had a, a laser pointer. But you see the door right there, the glass door. That section underneath that, what's that for? Nope. Nope. <laughs> Storage. Nope. <laughs> now, watch this. Most of you, like in my house and probably your house, you probably got pots and pans and stuff that are used for stores. <laughs> Come on, tell the truth, y'all. <laughs> now, watch this. I'm talking about things that you thought you knew, but you didn't know. Watch this. Y'all got more pots and pans and skillets down y'all. <laughs> y'all over here need to check a stick yet. It's, this is what it's designed for. It's designed for when you warm your food up, it's designed to put it under there to keep the food warm. It's a warmer. <laughs> it's not a broiler. It's not a toaster. <laughs> so aren't you glad you came to Sabbath school today? <laughs> you learned something, right? Y'all thought it was a storage area. Y'all thought it was, but it's actually designed, you got to realize before they had, listen, pay attention. Before they had microwaves, all that kind of stuff, if you were, if you were having a dinner or so and you want to keep your food warm, but I have to put it back in the oven to reheat it and burn it up, right? You just stuck it down on the bottom. It would keep it warm. It wouldn't, it wouldn't cook it. It would just keep it warm you know, from the heat that was in the oven. It wasn't designed to keep your pots and pans and skillets. Because you go in my house, there's more skillets and pots and pans. <laughs> we, I, we always thought it was a storage area. And I see heads nodding right now because y'all thought it was always a storage area. But here's my point. Going back to the PowerPoint. My point is, is that things that we thought we knew, 
sometimes we don't know that. Everybody understand the point? So, they thought that Jesus was going to be an earthly king. They thought that Jesus was going to establish his, and the reason they thought it was this. The reason they thought it was because they were taught that. All the prophecies point to that. When you read Isaiah and Jeremiah and all those prophecies, they point to Jesus being king of kings, lord of lords, the conquering king. How were they to interpret that? They thought that Jesus was going to be the king of the nations, right? Jeremiah talks about that. Isaiah talks about that. So they were taught that. So again, sometimes when you're taught, so that's why the, the scriptures tell us to do what? To study to do what? Show somebody else approved. Show yourself approved, right? You're responsible for information for yourself. Study to show yourself approved unto who? Unto God. Right, so that's why we have to read, we have to study. We don't take people's word for it. When, we, when, when they said the Bible says something, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to turn, you said, hold up, brother, where's that scripture again? Let, let me read that with you. Let, let me read that with you. Young man, young man, young man. Yeah, I can't think of your name. They actually are having an, a young adult Sabbath school class upstairs. If you have any young adults that want to go upstairs, they actually have a young adult class. And also, I think you left your jacket at the Sabbath school picnic, which is in the, in the Sabbath school office. God bless you. All right. <laughs> now, so, study to show yourself approved. Okay, now we're almost through, y'all, because I'm, I'm smelling the food and, 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 and we're moving on. <laughs> Amen. But is everybody getting the point? Okay, let's move. So, let's go, let's go to Tuesdays real, real quickly, and it is finished. It is finished. You don't have to read that, David, but everybody understands that when Jesus received, he gave up the ghost, he said it is finished. Now, when Jesus said it is finished, what was he saying was finished? Very quickly. I mean, We're going we to step on the gas real quickly here now. Go ahead. I see a hand there over here. But to see, where's my runner? Come on, son, move. When Jesus said, it is finished, what was finished? Uh, Dr. C. So when that first animal was sacrificed, it was sacrificed to demonstrate. I'm talking about in the Garden of Eden. It was sacrificed because the law in itself was inflexible. It said that the, uh, that the wages of sin is death. The law had been violated, and so something had to die. And so God initially set that forth in types and examples through animals. But one day, the true Lamb of God would come, and when he had completed his work, as we see on Calvary, then the work of meeting the demands of the law had been finished. All right, very good. Now, we're going to discuss some foundational truth. We're going to read real quick. Can you see that, David? Yeah. Let's see how good you are. Okay. All right, so these are foundational truths. Well, they foundational truths. We don't have time to go through all the scriptures, but these are foundational truths regarding uh, Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Read. After Adam's sin, no human being could be saved without the sinless life, sacrificial death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Does anybody understand that? Read. The death of Jesus was a requirement for the salvation of human beings from sin. Everybody understand that? Read. Jesus died as our substitute. We believe in substitutionary atonement. In other words, Jesus took the place of sinful human beings in order to address and overcome the sin problem for all of us so that human beings can be saved from sin. Can be saved in their sins. Can be saved in their sins. From sin. From sin. Does anybody understand that point? Saved from sin. Jesus wants to wash your sins away. Away. What can wash away my sins? What? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Help me. Blood. Right. He wants to wash away your sins, right? He, does, he, does, he doesn't want to just save you in your sins. No, wash, save you from your sins. Read. There is nothing any human being can do to add or to improve upon what Jesus Christ has done for us. Wait a minute, that's nothing we can do? Nothing. Suppose I, suppose I read my Bible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nothing? I can't pray my way in? Huh, I can't do good works? N nothing? Okay. <laughs> nothing, nothing you can do. 
We're saved by grace through faith. Faith in who? Faith in Jesus alone. There's nothing we can do. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. All right. Here's some more foundational truths. Read. We as individuals experience individual salvation by God's grace as manifest in the accomplishments of Jesus Christ when we partake of those accomplishments through faith, also known as trust. We experience the victory of Christ in our lives individually when through faith we open our hearts to God and the Holy Spirit takes the victory of Christ and changes our hearts and minds, the new covenant. This is known as being reborn, what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Does everybody understand that? We're good. All right, let's go. All right, so we're not going to read that. We know that Christ could have come down from the cross, but he didn't, and he did his unconditional love for us. It wasn't the nails that healed, healed him. It was his love. Is that right? Yeah. Amen. All right, so uh, those are thought questions, and, and, and uh, when you get home, and obviously when you study your lessons at home, look at those thought questions because they make you contemplate things that, that, that uh, the lesson is trying to convey. All right, it, it, it's talking about how bad sin and, and what, uh, how bad sin is, and that we should ought to have faith in what Christ has already done for us. Let's move on. Now, read that, somebody. Jesus died. Okay, everybody, let's read that. Here we go. Everybody, one, two, three, read. Jesus died for me. The least I can do is live for him. Everybody got that? That's the least you can do. And he's going to help you live for him. It's not like you're doing it by yourself. You can't do it by yourself. We just said he's going to help you do it. All you have to do is, is be willing to be made willing. In other words, just yield. Every day you get up and say, Lord, you take control of this day. I don't know what's going to happen, but this is your day. You help me to live right. And, that's, and you surrender. That's it right there. All right, let's move on. We, we're moving quickly. All right, so we got some texts here that, that very familiar texts that you all, you all know. Uh, we'll, I guess we'll read this. Can you, go ahead, David, you, you can read those. Matter yeah. of fact, let's, let's, let's uh, we'll read 16 with you. Read 14 and 15, David, and we'll join in on 16. Read. And as Moses lifted up the serpent, serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. All right, let's read this with my Say it with me. Let's, let's go. Four. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Very familiar text. If you don't know that text, you ain't been by nobody's church. You, ain't even, you haven't even driven down the street where the church is. <laughs> that text should just rub off on you. Can it die that means he died for you too. As unworthy as you are. He died, he, died, he died for you too. All right, we'll move on. Uh, all right, so now let's read this, let's read this together. Romans 6, 23, another good, very familiar text. Let's read. One, two, three, read. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So death is what you earn, wages are what you earn. When you go to work, they give you your what? Your wages, what you earn. So now what did you, from this text, what do you deserve? Why? Because you're a sinner. Because you're a sinner. You're a sinner. Your mama's a sinner. <laughs> Her mama's a sinner. <laughs> my mama, all right, talk about my mama. <laughs> well, talk about my mama too. She was a sinner. <laughs> right? All have sinned. This have a few people. All have, what, what, what's all mean? Look at that sinner right there. All have sinned and come short. We're all sinners, right? All have sinned. For the ways of sin is death, but now that conjunction. But the gift of God. What is a gift? Something that you, that, that's given. But now here's the important point, and we're almost through. Here's the important point with the gift. What's, what's an important, somebody raise that, get ready to run something, because I mean, somebody's going to ask this question. What's the important part about a gift? Oh, it's hand right here quickly. Oh, you got to say it in the microphone. <laughs> you have to receive it. You have to receive it. Right. The gift is available, but if you don't receive it, think about this analogy. Brother Hyman, you're really hungry. Sister Hyman's prepared you a, a, a scrumptious meal, your favorite foods, whatever they are. Got it all laid out there. You're hungry. 
Food's on the table. She even brings you the food. You know, do you want anything else, dear? <laughs> Got the food there. What will happen, Brother Hyman, if you never pick up the fork? You starve to death. The food's there. You have to receive it. Now, here's the last question. Here's another question. Hey, let's get somebody on this side over here. Look like, look like they want to talk over here. We got all these people over here ain't saying nothing. Let's, let's, get, let's get some people over here. <laughs> Sister Folsom, uh, somebody over here. Uh, so, how do we receive the gift that God has given us? Somebody on this side over here. Come on, son. Get ready to run this side. <laughs> how do we, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't, see, I didn't see him there. I didn't see him there. How do we somebody on this side? How do we receive the gift? What do we do to receive the gift? Let me call on somebody so y'all ain't saying nothing. Get, 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 get Sister Farm the mic right there. Amen. Amen. Sister Farm is good and spiritual. <laughs> she, we how do we receive to, the gift, Judy? We have to accept it. Just accept it. <laughs> it wasn't a trick question. Just say yes. Y'all about just say Just say yes. Just surrender. Just say yes. It's nothing, it's nothing, when you, it's nothing hard. It's nothing tricky. Just say yes. I surrender my will. So, so we just receive it. All right, let's move on. Let's see what, okay, those reflection questions. Well, we're almost through. The meaning of the cross. All right. So now, I don't know if you can read all that day, but see, do the best you can. This is the power of the cross. Read the verse. Read everything. For the preaching. For the preaching is, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But, also, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. All right, now, what is the power of the cross? Read. It's the ultimate revelation of God's justice uh -huh. against sin. Uh -huh. It's the ultimate revelation of God's love for sinners. It's the ultimate source of power to break the chains of sin. Uh -huh. It's our only hope of eternal life. It's the only antidote for a future rebellion in the universe. Now, he said antidote. Get ready, fellas. Here we go. What's an antidote? Give me a dictionary definition on the screen. I told him I was going to, I'm going to work him today. Amen. Give me a dictionary definition on the screen. Then get ready to go back to PowerPoint. So you got to Google it up or whatever. Put it on the screen. What's an antidote? Because Brother Tibbs scratched his head. Brother Tibbs don't know what an antidote is. I'm big fans of theological words. What's an antidote? I know, I know what you think you say, what you're thinking, though. Give me an antidote. What you got? He, 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 brother T, I, I'm going I'm to give brother, turn Brother Tip loose in a minute. What we got, fellas? What's an antidote? What, that's, that's a big word. What, what's an antidote? What's an antidote mean? What's anti? Okay, I'm going I'm 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 to put them putting on the screen. I, I see people with phones and stuff. Hold on, Deborah. Uh, hold, hold on, Deborah. I, I want to work there. Give, give them about 30 more seconds. What you got, fellas? All right, can y'all blow that up? Can, can you see that, David? <laughs> All right, here we go. A, a, med a medicine. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You want me to read it? Yeah, yeah, read, read. A medicine taken or given to counteract a particular poison. Ah, okay, that's good. Thank you. Very good. So it's something to counteract something bad, right? So when, when you have poison or something in your system, they give you something to counteract that, right? Now, Sister Adam will probably give you charcoal, so she's a health guru, right? Because so, in that one thing, and, 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 and Sister Jack will give you some, some uh, manuka honey, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? It counteracts the, the, the bad stuff in the, it, it counteracts the bad stuff that's in you, right? But that's what, that's what the antidote is. It's something that acts against the poison. What poison did we have in our lives? The poison of what? Sin. All of us needed something, right? It's kind of like if a snake bites you, they actually give you. Now, watch this. I just thought about this. This is one of them Jack and Mara's moments. The, the Holy Spirit just gave me this jacket. Actually, listen, you know what the antidote is for a snake bite? Snake venom. They give you some, and, and, and that kind of now is it, 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 clicking now. You remember when they, were, when they were in the wilderness, when they were being, being disobedient? Follow this. We're almost through. You remember when they were being disobedient and complaining and carrying on in the wilderness? And Jesus did what? 
It said they sent snakes into the camp. Guess what? The snakes were out there all along, Tammy. They in the wild. They in the wild. The snakes weren't. The snakes there all along. God had been protecting them from the snakes. And so when they start cutting up, God said, "All right." <laughs> God said, all right. Now, stick a pen there. What am I telling you? The worst person God can turn you over to is you. When you, God's trying to warn you, and he's trying to tell you to go on the correct path, but you keep going your way, God said, all right. <laughs> so I'm trying to teach you, I'm trying to keep you, but you won't listen. So now keep going, keep going your way. And so you walk out there, and, and, and something happens. And the same way, but now notice what Moses did. He told him to build a brass serpent, right, and lift it up. Put it in the middle of the camp where everybody can see it. I'm going somewhere. We talk about accepting the gift. And, it, and we almost do it for real. So he told him to put the serpent up in the camp where everybody can see it. Do y'all know, inspiration tells us, Terry Sims, there's something say all you have to do is look at it. Just look at it. Inspiration tells us that some people refuse, they were so hardened in their minds that they refused to even look at it. And they died. Now, if it had been me, <laughs> but take, even if I didn't believe, I would at least prop one eye open. <laughs> If a snake had bitten me, my leg is swelling up, I'm in pain, and they said, all you got to do is look at that serpent. <laughs> Either of you said, well, I don't think this is going to work. It didn't say look and believe what it just said. Just look. I would at least, like I said, with one eye. <laughs> but now this just shows you how, and we're we closing out. It just shows you how insidious sin is. Sin will make you crazy. Sin will make you crazy. God has given us, so we're going to read something on Friday's part, and then we're actually through. Um, God has given us eternal life. He's given us a gift. But you have to receive it. Now, we just, we just, just a few minutes ago, the example I gave, you thought how crazy it was for those people to refuse to look. But guess what? you just as crazy, too. When you persist in sin and don't receive the gift that God has given you. And we receive it how often? Daily. Right. We, hey, we, we constantly receive the gift. And because we're so thankful, we're going to read something in Friday's real quickly. That's it. I thought I saw a hand very quickly. I saw a hand right there quickly. Then I thought I saw another hand. And then we begin ready to close out. Yep. Stephanie said make it quick. I'm going to stretch it out. No, I talked to uh, Brother Kirkwood just a little bit earlier. He mentioned that he felt like uh, Christ didn't know that man was going to sin, but herein is the love of God so mysteriously manifested. How can an omniscient God not know that? And then the question becomes, if he knew that, why did he uh, love us so much that he would make provision for that? I mean, it is absolutely amazing that he would do that. So he was both unique and distinct. Only God himself becoming a man could make this gift available to us. A real quick illustration. You think of this guy, Usain Bolt, a Jamaican athlete. He ran the 200 and 400. He won three times in the Olympics. Compare him to a brain-dead man on a ventilator trying to run that same race. That's where we are in the relationship with God. We have no chance whatsoever to add anything to what he has done for us. Thank you, Dr. C. Okay, we got two more slides, and I promise you we, we through. Can you see that, David? Because I thought this was kind of profound, and we're going to talk about this a little bit in Sabbath School Overtime. For those of you who don't uh, know, Sabbath School Overtime, once we finish here and uh, eat our dinner, sometimes we'll be eating dinner at Sabbath School Overtime. Nevertheless, uh, that is right there. Go ahead, take, a, take your phone out or whatever you want to take a screenshot of that. Uh, we actually have, at 2 p.m., we actually continue to to, to discuss the Sabbath School lesson. For those of you who want to join us, that's the number right there. And uh, it's on the Zoom line. We have a good time. 
we, 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 we wax on poetically in, in our Sabbath school classes, but we, we bring out a lot of deep points. So, like I said, pull your phone out if you want to join us. Take a picture of it, and uh, we start at 2 p.m. All right, so go back to the other slide. Now, here's, I thought this, we got two more things to do, then be through. Read this right here. I thought this was fascinating. Read this. Watch this. All heaven triumphed in the Savior's victory. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. To the angels and the unfallen world, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Stop. He read that fast, but that didn't sink in. We always thought it was just for us because we were sinners. Why was it for them? They hadn't sinned, at least though the ones that were still in heaven. Why was it for them? Read on. Watch this. Read on, David. Well, then. Might the angels rejoice as they looked upon the Savior's cross. For though they did not then understand all, they knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain, that the redemption of man was assured, and that the universe was made eternally secure. Now, no, they didn't understand everything. You don't understand everything about the plan of salvation even now, right? They didn't understand everything, even though they were unfallen. Now, remember, a third of the angels was drawn out from Satan. Now, well, I thought this table was quite profound coming up right here, and we'll probably get, in, get into this a little deep in Sabbath school old time. Read, son. Not until the death of Christ. Read slow. Go ahead. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen world. Now, I put that in there. About 4,000 years. Let that sink in very quickly. That... It was 4,000 years from the creation, approximately, to the, to the crucifixion. The angels still didn't understand. Are y'all getting that? God allowed his character to be misrepresented for 4,000 years. 4,000 years. They didn't even understand. Are y'all getting that? This should show you how deceptive. Read that last statement. And it was because of this. The, the, apost the, the arch apostate, apostate that's, that's the devil, Satan. Had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Did y'all get that? Let that marinate for a while because y'all looking at that. <laughs> Y'all didn't know that, did you? I didn't either. That even that Satan was so, so deceptive until even the holy angels that stayed, they still had some questions. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until Christ died on the cross, they said, he really is crazy. <laughs> he really is a madman. He really is. He really is crazy. And so, they understood. Right, so again. All right, David, read that real quick and be gone. I saw that all heaven is interested in our salvation and shall be indifferent. Shall we be careless as though it were a small matter whether we are saved or lost? Shall we slight the sacrifice that has been made for us? Some have done this. They have trifled with offered mercy and the frown of God is upon them. God's spirit will not always be grieved. It will depart if grieved a little longer. After all that has been done that God could do to save men, if they show by their lives that they slight Jesus, offered mercy, death will be their portion, and it will be clearly purchased. In other words, you're going to get... In other words, you, you get what you deserve. You get what you chose. Everybody doesn't want to go to heaven. So God gives you your choice. God's not going to carry anybody kicking and screaming to heaven against your will. God gives you your choice. Last statement, and we, and we throw. Read. It will be a dreadful death, for they will have to feel the agony that Christ felt upon the cross to purchase for them the redemption which they have refused. And they will then realize what they have lost, eternal life and the immortal inheritance. Mm. The great sacrifice 
that had been made to save souls shows us their worth. When the precious soul is once lost, it is lost For how long? Forever. That's it. Now, I just saw some people taking screenshots. I just thought about this. Uh, Deborah James, raise your hand. Raise it a little high. I can't see. <laughs> I was messing with that. That's my friend, Deborah. Look, because uh, I saw some people taking screenshots. If you would give Deborah your email address, those who want uh, the PowerPoint presentation that we do every week, give Deborah an email address. I will email it to Deborah, and Deborah will send it to you. If I understand, because this is some things that you can go over uh, at home. So every week we, we do PowerPoint presentations so, we could, so it's visual so you can see what's going on. We've had a good study, amen? Amen. Don't refuse the free gift that God has given us. There's nothing, no pleasure, there's nothing in this world that compares to everlasting life. And it certainly doesn't compare with the sacrifice that Christ gave for us. Thank you so much, y'all. The food is, is done. There it is right there. Let's stand. Okay, bef bef keep playing there. Our deacon has an announcement before we have closing prayer. As a matter of fact, after he gives the announcement, he can give the closing prayer. Dr. C, you got anything? I just want to let you uh, be aware we are having a dinner, and it's a fellowship dinner, so everybody is welcome to stay. We hope that you will stay. But as we're asking everybody if they would, those that are participating in the dinner, please exit these back doors to the sanctuary and go down so we have just a line going down to the dinner. Even if you're going to pick your dinner up to go, you go the same way because we don't want everybody going different ways going down. We just have one line of traffic. But those that are not staying for the dinner, you can go down this exit right here and go out to the, to the parking lot. So we appreciate your cooperation so very much. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you so very much, Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Jesus. I pray that you would lead God and direct us. Help us to have a wonderful Sabbath, Lord. I pray that Lord, just now as we fellowship together, this is what we look forward to, Father, soon and very soon, that we will be around that welcome table, that supper table. Lord, just looking at you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so very much. In Christ's name, we ask these blessings and do give thanks. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Good study. If you're going to the den again.